uh, week two of this teaching series, uh, Finding Everland. Finding Everland. How do I find and follow God's plan for my life? Last week, we saw that finding and following God's plan is not exactly what we think, that, that God's plan for my life is more about who I am than where I go or what I do. That, that God wants me to desire Him more than He wants me to desire His answers for my life. And that finding God's plan really isn't about, about learning how to find His plan, but it's about how to follow His voice. When you hear His voice, and things don't work out the way, way you think, what are you supposed to do? There's a story that's told about a, a lady who was very faithful in exercise, and, and during the winter, one of the things she did, she'd walk around the mall. You, you know those folks that just walk around the mall for, for exercise? And as she walked around the mall, every time she came to the pet store, there was this big bird outside the pet store, and, and, the, and the bird had the ability to talk. And every time she walked past the pet store, the lady would go, Psst, hey, lady, you're ugly. And the lady was like, Seriously, I'm just offended by this. And lap after lap after lap after lap. Psst, hey, lady, you're ugly. Psst, hey, lady, you're ugly. Psst, hey, lady, you're ugly. And she just didn't know what to take. So lap after lap, day after day, week after week. Finally, she says, I've had enough. And she goes into the manager of the pet store and says, I can't take it anymore. This bird out there, every time I walk by, says, Psst, hey, lady, you're ugly. Oh, ma'am, I'm so sorry. Uh, this bird didn't come from our store. I, I'll take care of it. I promise you this will never happen again. I'm going to have a good talk with this bird, and it will never happen again. And if it does happen again, you tell me. And all she, she interrupted and said, I don't want to know what you're going to do to the bird. All I know is I don't want this bird to ever say that to me again. Ma'am, it will never happen again. Well, the next day she shows up to walk at the mall. She's, she's kind of going down one side. She can see the pet store, and she sees that the bird's still out there. So, oh, it's going to happen. So she walks around, gets in front of the pet store, and the bird goes, Psst, hey, lady. She turns and looks at the bird, and he goes, you know. <laughs> right? Here's what I want for you to be the Psst, you know voice in your life. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. That needs to be the psst, you know voice in your life. But I've got a hunch it's not. I've got a hunch that the psst, you know voice that you hear in your life more than anything else is that voice. I don't know if it came from a father. I don't know if it came from a, a spouse. I don't know if it came from a parent. I don't know where it came from. But I've got a hunch that psst, you know voice in your life is a voice that says, you'll never amount to anything. God can't have a plan for you. Look how bad you blew it. Look at all the sin you've committed. How could God use somebody like you? God has no hope for you. There's no hope for somebody like you. You're terrible, lousy, rotten, no good, very bad. And I just wonder, what's the psst, you know voice in your life? And what I want it to be, what God wants it to be is that voice where from Jeremiah chapter 29, 11, we can, we can take and we can claim God says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you a future filled with hope. But what happens when you've heard God's voice and you believe you know his plan and now all of a sudden it hasn't happened and it's been a day or a week or a month or longer? What do you do? I'm glad you're asking that question. Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37 introduces us to a man named Joseph. Joseph is Jacob's son. Jacob was Isaac's son. Isaac was Abraham's son. Yeah, that Abraham. When God said, I choose you and I'm going to bless you and through you the rest of the world is going to be blessed. So Abraham and Sarah have Isaac and Isaac has a son named Jacob and Jacob wrestles with God. And God changes his name to Israel. And he has sons, literally the children of Israel, and one of them's name is Joseph, and he was one of the younger sons, and he was born to, uh, to uh, Jacob late in life. And that's where we pick up the story, Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. And there's some things I need you to hold on to, because what I want to do is kind of retell this story for you. I want to introduce it, retell it, and then grab about four or five principles that, that help us know, how do I keep moving forward? How, how do I keep moving forward when God's plan isn't coming true? And I, I've been waiting a while. How do I keep moving forward? Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. Now Israel, Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made him a richly ornamented robe. And he made a richly ornamented robe for him. That's not how you know that, right? Some of you know it, that Joseph had a coat of many colors. Some of you, a little more contemporary, he had an amazing 
Technicolor dream coat, that's right. You know the story, right? That's Joseph, that's the coat. He's got this coat and he, he wore it with pride because his father loved him. Now when his brothers saw that the father loved him more than any of them, they hated him. Let me say that again. They hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Hold on to that in your mind. They could not speak a kind word to him and they hated him. Now, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. So there's this level of hatred, and he has a dream that tells what God's plan for his life is, and he tells them about it. Now there's this level of hatred. They hated him all the more. And he said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, and suddenly my sheaf rose up and stood upright, and your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. (laughs) His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? Nice job, little brother. Go do the dishes. I don't think so. And they hated him all the more because of his dreams. So they had this level of hatred. Now they got this level of hatred. Now we're up at this level of hatred. The hatred's just continuing to grow. And they can't speak a word to him. Verse 9, and then he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. This time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. And they're like, seriously, little brother? We can't stand you. Get out of our sight. So life continues. Joseph had clearly heard God's voice. There's going to come a time when I raise you up and you're going to be a leader. And your brothers and your family and everybody's going to come and bow down in front of you. And it didn't happen. And the next day, uh, Joseph's dad sends his brothers out to take care of the sheep somewhere, you know, 40, 50 miles north of where they live. And a couple of days go by and Jacob says to Joseph, hey, I need you to go check on your brothers. Just go find out if they're okay. And if they're okay, come back and report to me. Tell me that they're doing all right. So, so, Jake, uh, so Joseph takes off and he goes 50 miles to this place called Shechem where the brothers are supposed to be and they're not there. And he sees another shepherd and he says, hey, I've been looking for my brothers. Oh yeah, I know them. I, I heard them say that they were headed towards Dothan. Why don't you go check there? Now here's what I need you to know. Dothan is not on the way back home. Dothan is still further north. Joseph now has to go an extra 13 miles to find his brothers. And he does. He travels the 13 miles finding his brothers. And remember, they hate him. And they can't say a kind word about him or to him. And they see him coming across the desert. And they look at one another and they're like, Good grief, here comes the dreamer. We thought we were far enough away from home that we wouldn't have to deal with him. What in the world is he doing? And they come up with this plan. Okay, here's the deal. We're far enough away from home. Here's what we can do. We can kill him. When he comes up, we'll kill him. We'll shred up his, his amazing coat and we'll put some animal blood on it. We'll take it back home and tell dad some wild animal got him and he's dead. We'll be done with him. And Reuben, one of the older brothers, said, no, 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 we can't do that. Reuben's just trying to buy some time. said, hey, here's a pit. When he comes, this is a, a well that doesn't have any water, and let's just throw him in there, and let's kind of sit back. So, so here comes Joseph in this amazing coat. They're like, yeah, we'll show him what not to wear. And so, so they, they grab a hold of him, and they beat him up, and they take him off, and they, they throw him in a pit. Have you ever had one of those days where you are doing nothing except what you're supposed to be doing? You're honoring God by honoring your employer. You're honoring God by honoring your spouse. You're honoring God by doing exactly what it is you were supposed to do. In fact, you didn't just do what you were told to do. You went an extra 13 miles out of your way to make sure you could serve somebody else. And all of a sudden, in the blink of an eye, in the snap of a finger, you end up in a pit. Ever had a day like that? Where you're doing exactly what it was. You knew God's plan for your life, and you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. And the test results come back, and it's a brain tumor. Or you're sitting in a courtroom. Or you're sitting in a classroom with one of your children's teachers, and you had no idea the trouble they were in. Or your spouse says it's over. You've just been doing exactly what it was. You knew God's voice. You knew God's plan. You knew what God was going to do. And now all of a sudden, you've got a day like, have you ever had a day like that? Joseph had a day like that. And you wonder, could this be part of God's plan? Is it worth it? So he's sitting in the pit, and his brothers are eating lunch, and they see a, a, a group of people traveling, a caravan of people, Ishmaelites, I think gypsies are coming across the desert, and they're like, I, I got an idea. We don't have to kill him. 
We can sell him. We'll keep the coat. We'll still rip it up, put animal blood on it, go back and tell dad that he's dead. But we can get something out of this. And so now, sure enough, this, this, this caravan pulls up and they're like, hey, we've got a really handsome young kid down, down in, the, in the pit and we'd like to sell him. What do you give us for him? Well, let us look at him. They bring him up. You're right. He's handsome. He is strong. He's, he's good looking. Uh, we'll give you uh, uh, eight ounces of silver sold. And Joseph is now in a caravan traveling across the desert. Have you ever had a day like that? Where the people you thought loved you the most sold you off down the road for a really inexpensive price? Where they marginalized you and said you didn't matter? Where they did whatever they had to do to rid themselves of you? You ever had a day like that? Joseph had a day like that. Surely this couldn't be the plan of God. How in the world are you going to raise me up and everybody's going to bow down in front of me? Well, the caravan ends up in Egypt and these guys say, we got eight ounces of silver for him. I bet we'd get more for him here in Egypt. And they put him on the slave block and sure enough, this guy named Potiphar, he's the captain of the military guard. He buys Joseph and he puts him in charge of his household. It's kind of like his butler. And the scripture says that God was with Joseph and everything Joseph did, he had success and he was making Potiphar money and, and Potiphar said to him, everything in my household is yours except my wife. You know about the wife? The wife saw Joseph and he was handsome and he was young and, and, and she's an Egyptian lady who's, who has, is a ruler and, and you've seen the pictures of how uh, Egyptian lady rulers, how they, how they dress and it's very provocative and they're very beautiful and, and she's very appealing and she comes to Joseph one day and says, hey, uh, come to bed with me. And Joseph says, no, not going to do it. Let me tell you why. A couple of reasons. Number one, you're married. And your husband, let me say that again, your husband, your husband, that everything in his household was mine except you, his wife. Did you remember? You're his wife. You're his wife, right? And he begins to say that and said, how could I sin against God by doing this? Day after day, day after day, she, she keeps after Joseph. And he's getting ready to leave one day, I think. And she says, hey, call me, maybe. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. And so, uh, no, no hissing. Hissing's not allowed. And so um, uh, he comes back to work. He's cleaning up the bedroom the next day. And she's like, I want you and I want you now. And she reaches over and tries to give him a hug and he, he escapes the hug and she grabs off a piece of his clothing and he runs for his life. And she starts telling lies about him. To Potiphar, the slave of yours, tried to rape me. How could you let somebody in our household that was going to do that to me? Have you ever had a day like that? When all you were doing was honoring your convictions in front of God, living according to God's word, not going to give in to the temptation that's in front of you, and now all of a sudden somebody's telling vicious lies, spreading uh, awful rumors about you. Have you ever had a day like that? Joseph had a day like that. He finds himself in prison. And the scriptures say the Lord was with him, and he began to find success in the prison. And the warden of the prison put Joseph in charge. He was second in command of the prison, and everything the scriptures say, the warden of the prison didn't, I don't think he even showed up to work, but he didn't have to, because Joseph ran the prison with excellence. And a couple of guys in the prison. This was the king's prison, by the way. It's the place where the king put his prisoners. And in the, in the prison, we find there's the king's chief baker, and the king's chief kind of wine steward is his cupbearer. And they have a dream. We've got some dreams, and we don't know what they mean. It, Joseph said, I, I know how to interpret dreams. Tell me. So they tell him the dreams, and he's like, I got good news and bad news. One of you gets good news, one of you gets bad news. Mr. Baker, you get the bad news. Three days from now, you're going to get out of prison, but you're going to get killed. Mr. Cupbearer, Mr. Wine Steward, good news for you. Three days from now, you're going to get out of prison, you're going to get your job back, and life's going to be back to everything you wanted it to be. And by the way, when that happens, would you please remember me? Say a kind word about me. Yep, no problem. Happy to do it. Day goes by, two days go by, two years go by, and the wine steward didn't remember Joseph. Have you ever had a day, a week, a month, a year, or a couple of years like that where all you've done is tell people how to find God and what God wants for their life and how they can make progress spiritually and, and, and they turn their back on you. Joseph had two years like that. Well, two years come and go and the Pharaoh has a dream. He doesn't just have one dream, he has two dreams. And as he has this dream, he's like, I wonder what this means. And it begins to trouble his heart. And he says, I need some help. And the, bake, uh, the, the, the chief uh, cupbearer says, 
When I was in prison, there was this guy named Joseph. He interpreted my dream, and it came true. Maybe he can help. Pharaoh says, send me Joseph. And Joseph comes up, and Pharaoh tells him both of the dreams. And Joseph says, hey, Pharaoh, you've had this dream twice because God's already decided in his mind what he's going to do, and it's going to happen quickly. Here's what's going to happen. Egypt is going to have seven years of abundance, more abundance with all crops and vineyards and anything we've ever had, and it's going to be the best seven years we've ever had. But immediately following those seven years of abundance are going to become seven years of famine. And the famine is going to be so bad that nobody's going to remember the abundance. So Pharaoh, here's what I think you ought to do. I think you ought to come up with somebody who can run a program for you. We need to start saving food. We need to save grain. We need to save a wine. We need to put everything in storage so that when the famine comes, we'll be prepared. And Pharaoh says, you're obviously no ordinary Joe. I want you to be in charge of this thing. And Joseph found favor. And Pharaoh said, there's only going to be one person in all of Egypt that outranks you, and that's me. Here's what I need you to see. Genesis chapter 37, verse 2. When Joseph hears God's voice, when he sees God's plan for his life, Joseph, it says, was a young man of 17. He's 17 years old. 17 years old when he hears this, when he has this dream, when he hears God's voice. Turn over with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41, 46, as he has this encounter with Pharaoh. Genesis 41, 46 says this, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh. Do the math. How long has Joseph been waiting? 30 minus 17? 13 years. How in the world do you keep going 13 years? You knew for a fact with certainty God's plan for your life. And now all of a sudden it's taken you uh, to a pit where your brothers beat you up and left you for dead. To they sold you off in slavery. You're in a caravan of gypsies going across the desert. You get lied about by your boss's nymphomaniac wife. And now you're in prison. Surely this can't be God's plan. 13 years he's been waiting. But wait, there's more. Seven years of abundance. 13 plus 7, do the math with me, 20. The scriptures say that when the famine came, two years into the famine, Joseph's brothers came and bowed down in front of him. 20 plus 2, 22 years. Joseph's been waiting over two decades for God's plan to come true in his life. How in the world... Do you keep moving forward? When you have every reason and almost right to quit, how in the world do you keep moving forward when you want to quit to wait on God? Let me share with you some principles out of this story. We're going to fly through them pretty quickly. Last year when I was putting together this year's teaching schedule, I really thought we were going to do a, an entire series on the life of Joseph. So I've got an entire teaching series ready on the life of, life of Joseph. It's 14 weeks long. You're going to get it in about the next 12 minutes. <laughs> all right? So I'll hold on to your seats. Buckle up. Here we go. All right? Joseph's 17. He's 30. And then, you know, that's 13. Another nine years, he's 39. He's been waiting 22 years for God's plan to come through. Here's the principle. When life is in a holding pattern, I can't look at you guys right now because of this. <laughs> because of the holding pattern you had to go through. When life is in a holding pattern, when life is in a holding pattern, it's not how long you wait that's an important it's how you wait for whatever length of time, right? It's not how long you wait that's important. It's how you wait for whatever length of time. How do you wait? Let me share with you from the scriptures six or seven ways to wait. Number one, I wait alertly. Blesses the man, blesses the woman who listens to me, God says, awake and ready for me each morning, alert and responsive as I start my day's work. I love that. Perfect. God says, hey, I've got work to do every single day, and I'm going to start it today, and I hope you show up. I hope you show up, and you're alert, and you're ready to respond to the task that I've given you. We'll talk more about that. In one occasion, Joseph's task, while he's waiting for this dream to come true, for everybody to bow down in front of him, one of the days is go find your brothers. One day it's serve the prison warden. One day it's served Potiphar. For a string of years, it's going to be served Pharaoh. Waiting is very simply this, friends. It's active involvement in the task that's assigned. I'm going to say that again. It's active involvement in the task that's assigned. And those of us who are followers of Jesus better understand what it means to wait because we are awaiting his arrival for the second time. We're awaiting him to come back, not as a baby, but this time as a king. And until he comes back, he says, you better not just sit back and twiddle your thumbs. You better be actively involved in the tasks that I've assigned you. And what is that task? Love God, love people, and make a difference. On one occasion, uh, Paul writes to this guy named Philemon. He says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. 
Are you sharing your faith? Are you actively involved in the task that God's assigned you? It may, may seem like it's nothing very big. Go find your brothers. Or institute Pharaoh's famine plan. Maybe a huge task, but it's actively involved, and I, I wait alertly. When I'm trying to wait alertly, two questions I ask myself when life's kind of in that holding pattern. Number one, is God trying to teach me something? Okay, God, what lesson do you have for me to learn? And question number two, is God trying to change something in me? Is God trying to teach me something, or is God trying to change something inside of me? That's what it means to be alert. Okay, God, what are you trying to do here? I wait alertly. Number two, I wait expectantly. I wait expectantly. The songwriter says, I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. The watchmen are the people that are guarding over the city, and they've got the night watch, and they're keeping the city safe from intruders and from thieves and from robbers and from invading armies. And what happens when the dawn breaks, what happens when the sun comes up is a sigh of relief. You're waiting expectantly for a sigh of relief for God to act. My favorite verse in the entire Joseph story comes from chapter 41, verse 36. Chapter 41, verse 30, I'm sorry, verse 32. Chapter 41, verse 32. Listen to this. Joseph is interpreting Pharaoh's dreams. He's told him what it means. Now he says this. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. The reason, Pharaoh, you got a dream in two forms is that God's firmly decided it in his mind and he's going to act quickly. Do you remember anybody else that got a dream in two forms? Joseph. And he's been waiting 13 years, but he still says, this is what I believe. God's decided it in his mind and he's going to act quickly. I think Joseph woke up every morning saying, okay, today's the day. Today's the day God's plan is going to come true for my life. And he'd been waiting 13 years. That amazes me that he could say, I know that I know that I know God's plan for my life. God's decided in his mind, and he's going to do it quickly. How about you? Are you waiting expectantly for God to come true, to be true to his word? Number three, I wait quietly. Scripture says it's good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It doesn't mean I don't stay actively involved in the task assigned and try to, try to work at it, but, but I just wait. Okay, God, you're going to deliver. Number four, I wait patiently. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked screens. This, friends, this is where I struggle. I don't know about you. When I'm waiting uh, for God to do something that I believe he said he's going to do, and it doesn't happen, and I'm doing my best to be faithful, I'm doing my best to be obedient, and I'm I'm just just finding myself in places that I don't think I should be. I I struggle when I look at other people and like, good grief, they're not even trying to live a life that honors God and look at the success they're having. And God says to me, don't fret about that. Wait patiently for me. You don't worry about them. I'll take care of them. You, you worry about you, Tim. You wait patiently for me. Number five, I, I, I wait realistically. I wait realistically. Being confident of this, God said, God's word says that he who began a work in you will carry it on to completion until Christ Jesus. Jesus is going to do what he has to do inside of me. And number finally, I wait cautiously. I wait cautiously. Woe to those who quarrel with their makers. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Does your work say the potter has no hands? God, I I don't understand it. I've been waiting a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade. 22 years, two decades now. God, you're still in charge. How do you keep moving forward? One of the first days after Joseph had his dream, his dad sent him to Shechem. His brothers weren't there. They're 13 miles on north. They hated him. They were not going to speak a kind word to him. Joseph went the 13 extra miles anyway. How do you go the extra miles? Not just mile, but how do you go the extra miles? When you have every reason to quit, here's what I think the truth is. Joseph, when he had every reason to quit, went the extra miles because of his father's love. This is what dad wanted me to do. And when he went to find his brothers, that was his earthly father. When he said no to Potiphar's wife, he went the extra mile because of his love for his heavenly father. You keep going when you have every reason to quit simply because of your love for the father and you're waiting for him to do what only he can do. Principle number two, or principle number one, when life's in a holding pattern, it's not how long I wait that matters, it's how I wait for whatever length of time. Principle number two, Genesis 39, over and over again, and three times in chapter 39, we see this phrase, 
But while Joseph was there, the Lord was with him, and he showed kindness and favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Here's the deal. God never means for me to live my life imprisoned, but rather empowered. And I'm not talking about a physical jail cell. I, I, God doesn't want you to be imprisoned to somebody else's guilt, to somebody else's expectations. God doesn't want you to be uh, imprisoned to, to doubt. I, I don't know. God never intends for you to live your life in prison, but always empowered. Very quickly, five things underneath that. We'll just push through these. Number one, you have to keep a proper perspective. If I'm going to be empowered, I need to keep a proper perspective. Joseph was handsome and good-looking, but he knew his life wasn't based on the right clothes or the right looks or the right situation or the right circumstances or the right job. He knew his circumstances. His, his perspective was that God was God. I cannot sin against God, he said. Maintain a proper priority. Maintain a proper priority. Joseph, when the temptation came and he kept saying no, was faced with a situation and he finally just ran away. I want to know while you're waiting on God right here, right now, in this moment, what temptation do you need to run away from? You don't need to tiptoe around it anymore. You don't need to get closer to it. You just need to run away from it. The scriptures say this, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Run from anything that gives you evil thoughts that men and women often have. Stay close to anything that makes you want to do right. Have faith and love and enjoy the companionship of those who love the Lord and call on him with a pure heart. What do you need to run away from right now, friend? Right now. What do you need to run away from? Don't mess with it. You're playing with fire. Joseph maintained a proper priority. He followed through. Remember, lack of follow through, you're one decision away from stupid. Joseph knew that, and he followed through. Next, experience a perfect peace. The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. God went ahead of him. God went alongside of him. God came after him. Exhibit a positive attitude. How can you say 13 years later, God's going to act soon? You have a positive attitude in who God is. And finally, exude a patient demeanor. Day after day, day after day, Joseph was patient for 22 years for God's plan to come true. Principle number three, very simply, is this. The most powerful pulpits in the world aren't found in churches on Sunday, but in your workplace on Monday. Joseph wasn't able to go to the temple and worship. He wasn't able to have the tabernacle. He was in a foreign country that worshiped foreign gods, but every day he showed up, whether he was the, uh, in charge of the prison, whether he was in charge of Potiphar's house, whether he was in charge of Pharaoh's famine plan, Joseph showed up every day and gave an honest day's work. The most powerful pulpits in the world aren't on church on Sunday, but in your workplace on Monday. As you honor God by being a faithful Boss, as you honor God by being a faithful employee, as you do that, friends, it's just, just that simple. Principle number three. Principle number four comes from Genesis chapter 41. says this, for successful Christian living, it's not how much of the Holy Spirit you have, but how much of you the Holy Spirit has. And there's a difference. We live in a world that says, oh, I've got to have more of the Holy Spirit, got to have more of the Holy Spirit, my friends. When you receive... Jesus is your Savior. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. Jesus said, hey, when I go away, I'm going to send another one who's exactly like me to come and live inside of you. He's going to guide you, and he's going to convict you, and he's going to lead you. The question is, how do I, how do I have more of the Holy? How does the Holy Spirit have more of me? Pharaoh said of Joseph, can we find anyone like this man in whom rests the Spirit of God? Four things. Don't have time to go into them. Let's, let me give you the blanks. I need to desire the fullness of God in my life. Remember, God's plan for my life is that I desire him more than his answers for my life. Number two, I need to declare my need. Hey, God, I'm facing this temptation, and I don't know how I'm going to say no. I need your strength. I need your deliverance. I need your victory. Hey, God, these people hate me, and I'm supposed to go 13 miles out of my way to do something for them. God, I, I have a need. Number three, I need to denounce the sin in my life. Hey, God, I gave into that temptation, and I blew it. Will you forgive me? The scriptures say you confess your sins. He forgives your sins. Number four, I need to determine to remain filled. Ephesians 5.18 says, do not be drunk with wine, but, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Keep on being filled, literally is the Greek. Keep on being filled with the Spirit over and over again. Don't let anything else control your life other than the Spirit of God. Keep on being filled. Hey, God, I, I need your strength to say a kind word to those who hate me. God, I need a, your strength to go the extra 13 miles. Hey, God, when my brothers come and bow down in front of me, and they don't recognize me, all I have to do is one motion and I can take their heads off. Hey God, I don't want to be that person. You know the story, right? 22 years later, 
Joseph's brothers show up because there's a famine, not just in Egypt, but in all of the land. And Egypt's the only place that has food. And they show up to get the food, and they stand in front of Joseph, and they don't recognize Joseph. But now he, he walks like an Egyptian, and he talks like an Egyptian, and he dresses like an Egyptian. Right? They don't recognize him, but Joseph recognizes them. And he finally reveals himself to them, and they are terrified because they know how they treated him. And they know the natural human response is one motion, take our heads off. Genesis chapter 45, Joseph says this to them, God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. Then Genesis 50, the story kind of ends this way before Joseph dies. His brothers came and threw themselves down before him. We're your slaves, they said. And Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. I know what your intentions were, but I know more importantly than that what God's intentions were. And wherever I was, whether I was in the pit or the caravan or the bedroom with the nymphomaniac boss's wife or the prison or taken here in Pharaoh's court, I've known that this was part of God's plan. And I was willing to wait 22 years and be faithful every single day of that because God had a plan. So here's the deal. Here's, the, here's what Joseph knew about God's plan. God's plan is that God will make me the right person and put me in the right place to serve the right purposes of God. That God wants to make me the right person to put me in the right place to serve the right purpose. Maybe, maybe we can say it this way. Wherever you are, God's doing something. If he has spoken to you and you clearly know his plan, say, Tim, I don't know how to know his plan. I'm, I'm not sure what that looks like. I don't know how to, how to go about that, finding that in his word. Well, in a couple of weeks, I'm starting a new series uh, called Fit. It seems to be a theme at the new year, right? Fit. All the new, you know, P93X or, or X3 or whatever it is, T25, all these fitness things that come out. Well, how do we get spiritually fit? How, we're going to talk about how to know God's word, that when God says something, he intends to do it, and it's going to happen soon. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. But until then, wherever I am, God's using these circumstances to make me the right person, to get me in the right place at the right time to accomplish his purposes. Up at the top of your teaching outline, I've given you what I call the, the wherever formula. The wherever formula, wherever formula. Wherever I am, whatever I'm going through, here's the formula. And it goes like this. My perspective of life plus my perception of my circumstances equals my performance in living. My perspective of life plus my perception of my circumstances equals my performance in living. We don't say that around here this way, that way very much. Here's how we say it. He's God. He's good. I will trust him. My perspective of life. Joseph says to his brothers, am I in the place of God? I'm not going to take his place. It's his world. It's his creation. He's in charge. He's God. That's my perspective of life. My perception of my circumstances is that he's good. Wherever I am, in the pit, in the caravan, in the prison, he's good. He's going to work all things together for his glory and my good. And my performance in life, then, is simply what? I will, say it with me, trust him. And for 22 years, day in and day out, when he had every reason to quit, Joseph kept moving forward because of his father's love. How about you? Will you keep moving forward today? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thanks so much for the examples that we have in the scriptures of people who clearly heard your voice and knew your plan for their life and were willing to, to wait 22 years faithfully for you to do what only you could do. Because they understood what we need to understand. So God, help us understand this today. That wherever we are today, our perspective of life needs to be your God. The perception of our circumstances needs to be that you're good. 
And the only performance you're looking at for from us today is that we will trust you, that we will be actively involved in the task that you assign today. But God, sometimes that gets hard. Right now you're asking of some of us to go an extra 13 miles for someone that hates us. For someone who can't and hasn't said a kind word about us in the last decade. And God, you're asking us to go an extra 13 miles. We need your strength. God, some of us right now, we've been doing everything that we've known to do to follow you, and we would just admit we've had one of those days where we're in a pit. God, we, we got news we didn't expect. We we're being treated in ways we don't deserve. And the future is really unclear about what happens next. And God, we didn't do anything to bring it on, but we need to know that you're working this for our good and your glory. God, someone that's listening right now has been sold down the road by a family member, by a friend, by a co-worker. They've been marginalized and treated as irrelevant. Maybe even treated as unhuman. God, the pain's deep. And you're still God. May they recognize you in the midst of that. God, some of us have been waiting a long, long time for you to do what we believe you're going to do, for you to bring a loved one back into a relationship with us and with you, for you to meet a financial need, for you to bring a job, for you to bring physical healing. God, in the midst of that, while we wait, may we always understand that you're God and that you're good. And wherever we are, may we trust you. And God, my prayer for each one very simply is this, that that, psst, hey, you, voice that's louder than any other voice in their mind, would be your voice declaring for I know the plans I have for you plans to prosper you and not harm you plans to give you a future filled with hope God may we trust in your plan wherever we are whatever the circumstance in Jesus name we pray amen if you've made a decision today would you let us know on the connect card would you let us know electronically somehow we would love to know after the gathering, I'm going to ask the pastoral staff if they'd be hanging around down front to meet with you, to, to pray with you, if there's anything we can do to help you take the next step of your journey. Maybe today you're just hurting and you need somebody to pray with you and over you. We'd be honored to do that before you leave this place. If you're watching somewhere around the world, would you please let us know what you heard God say and what steps you took today to obey. You stand with me for a word of blessing and benediction. They had a family... Uh, Kylie's family let me come by this weekend and one of the things uh, that I got to do while I was there, I got to be there when mom brought in uh, all of her homework from the teachers and put them on the table and Kylie said, Ugh. <laughs> and maybe with what you heard today, God's calling you to do something and that's the feeling you got, Ugh. I got to go do it. Do it quickly, do it obediently. And watch God bless you and give you the strength to do just that. Heavenly Dad, thanks for the time that we've had together, together in this place. Thanks for your clarity. Thanks for the ways you've spoken to us. And Father, I pray over each and every one, over each individual, over each couple, over each family unit, over each home, that this blessing would rest on them. Should Jesus not come back until we get to meet together again in this place? Brothers and sisters, receive this blessing from God himself. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace wherever you are.
whatever you're going through for however long it lasts. God bless you. I love you. God loves you. We'll see you next week.